so good afternoon. This is really an impressive showing for a rainy Monday afternoon. Um, thank you. My name is, for those who don't know me, is Katherine Reinhardt, and I am the manager of the Sonoma County History and Genealogy Library, and I work with um, Joanna Kolosov over there, <laughs> and she and Rose, who you'll meet in a few minutes, are really the the brainchilds be behind the, the program that we're gonna have today. Um, a few other introductions are in order. Uh, we have Kate Keaton in the back, who is the branch manager of the Central Library, but some of you who live here in Petaluma might remember her from being the manager here at the Petaluma Library. She's here today representing a new program partnership that the library has with uh, Vet Connect. So after the program, um, we'll, you'll be welcome to go back and, and find out what that is all about. So I'm the manager of the History and Genealogy Library. What's that? Some of you know, some of you don't. Um, it's a special collection within the Sonoma County Library System where we, guess what, collect local history and help people with their genealogy. And uh, we welcome a visit. We brought a few um, materials. We have some, a binder there of something from our collection of letters that are written to, from Vietnam veterans to. It was a care package sent by the Vietnam Veterans Association to um, soldiers in the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. And um, it's their thank you letters back that we talked So, and I bring that up because that's, you know, we have materials related to those serving in the war at different times. And, um, I also would like to introduce Kay Chandler, who is right there, who is um, videotaping today's uh, presentation. I think without further ado, I will introduce Rose Nowak, who is the president of the Redwood Empire Unit 77 of military women across the nation. She too, like myself, is a Petaluma resident. She is a native of North Dakota, served in the United States Air Force as a medic at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi during the Vietnam War. And Rose is going to introduce our panelists. The, the format is each of our um, panelists will go through some things. Um, we've prepared some questions for them that will answer those. And then again, we'll end with questions from you, answers from them, and hopefully just some general dialogue. And uh, so I think with that, I will turn it over to Rose. Thank you, Catherine. And again, I wanted to acknowledge all the help that Joanna and Catherine have given me in putting this together. And I want to thank our panelists who agreed to participate. Um, and again, I extend an invitation if you are a woman veteran or if you know of someone who is, um, we welcome you and would love to have you join our organization. There's information on the back table. Uh, please help yourself. Any questions, uh, feel free to talk to any of us after the uh, presentation. And without further ado, our first panelist will be Mary Lou Lustelot. Mary Lou was served in the waves in the Navy during World War II. Our next panelist is Emily Souza. Emily served during the Korean era, also a wave in the Navy. And our third panelist is Kate O'Hare Palmer. Kate was an Army nurse, a first lieutenant, oh, and served in <laughs> Vietnam. Lisa Lim is our fourth panelist, and she served during the Iraq Gulf War era in the Army. And our fifth petty officer first class, Bethany La Rosa, who is stationed at the uh, Coast Guard Station at True Rock. Thank you. Mary Lou, can you tell us about your hometown? I would, thank you, but it's too close because I'm, I've got too loud a voice. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm 94, and I'm, uh, I don't expect to have such a big voice, but uh, I've got it. <laughs> uh, I'm Mary Lou Lewis Delot. I was born in Sioux City, Iowa. My hometown was, uh, well, when I was young, it had, was 7,500 people. 
so that it was growing fast and it was one of the wealthiest uh, home, uh, uh, hometowns in uh, Iowa because we had a big um, stockyards and our stockyards were the, was the big thing. Uh, it, uh, it drew lots of money because we had lots of cattle and it was a great, a great, no, an odor that you wouldn't believe, but, <laughs> but, but you liked it because of what you did and what you saw down there. So it was good to be there. Um, my father uh, was a supervisor of, of Marathon Oil and uh, he, like a dumb Irishman, when it was sold to another oil company, who, oh, maybe I better say, first, my sister and I loved him being there because we climbed every tank there was, <laughs> and there were lots of them, and we would go, because there were small stairs, and they went around the tanks all the way to the top, and we would climb those stairs, and have a good time on Sunday after we had come back from church. We were waiting to go home to eat. So, as as uh, Sioux City went, it was, uh, my father uh, was a bugler in the World War I, and every 4th of July, uh, he was in marching in it, so my sister and I loved watching all the commotion that went on for that. We were still, I can remember very young when we started and we all enjoyed it. And then we had an uncle that had a chick store and he sold the chicks there, but they also were, he had, they out of town, uh, out of this little town, you went down back to another little town and uh, that's where, the, where they had a hatchery and it was a big hatchery. It was fun to go there and we all did uh, because we, you go up and down the aisles and you could see the little chicks as they came out of that, uh, out of the, well, you saw them in their stages as they broke the eggs. And it was, for a child, it was something that you couldn't believe. You know, you would stand there and just in awe to see them picking away. <laughs> and we played in all of those because they rolled all over the, the, the place. And so we would play the, in those, where they would put the, the, the where they take out the, the chicks and put them in, in uh, getting ready to ship them out. And my uncle shipped to both uh, Iowa and uh, all the surrounding, Nebraska and Minnesota. So he did well. Anyway, um, what was I gonna say? By by, uh, what? What was your question? <laughs> you were gonna, um, why did you decide to enter the why military did I, Why service? did I go in the military? Well, I went in the military mostly because I got interested in what happened. Uh, we moved to uh, Illinois where I had an uncle and I, I worked in the uh, Piggly Wiggly store <laughs> and I learned to be a cashier but I had to learn all of everything in the store. So I made, my first job was to make uh, uh, ice cream for three stores, which I loved. It was something I adored. My uncle used to say, Mary Lou, you're gonna get sick of that stuff and you're not gonna like it anymore. I love it to this day. <laughs> so anyway, we didn't do that. But uh, I, in Illinois, um, in Iowa, we had uh, our schooling, uh, I was up to the 11th grade when we moved. And in Iowa, you have a strictly courses that you can take. You can take a business course, you can take a, uh, a well, there, there's three or four that you may take. Um, but unfortunately, when I went to Illinois, it was Mattoon, Illinois, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it was a college town, and you could only take the college. So I had to go back some of the courses to the ninth grade, which wasn't very pleasant, because I had to climb over railroad because it would come in on the side, and uh, you it would be there for maybe a day, 
And so I climbed over all of those things to get to the other side. <laughs> but anyway, it was a fun time. I probably entered the service from all that I enjoyed with my dad's friends when uh, we were uh, at home and because he was in the, had been in the service and was a bugler and he was still playing a horn. Uh, it wasn't the bugler, but he was playing a horn in the marching ones. And so we, it was the first ones. But in uh, Illinois, from the school, ROTC was, a, was, the, was the big thing for the guys. And a great many of our boys were in it. And they were all sent, it all stopped. And they graduated before the rest of us when we were to graduate. They went, graduated six months before they were given their, their, their paper. And they, they were taken to a college and they became first, first officers coming in to, to the service. And so I tried to go into the Marines. Well, I wasn't old enough. I was only 19 and you had to be 20 at that time. And so that's the way I, I, I quit. And when, when I graduated, then I went to work, naturally. I did not work for Piggly Wiggly. I went where my mother and sister were, and they were in Wisconsin by that time, and a cousin. And uh, I went to work for a place that made bullets. <laughs> and I was just a secretary with that uh, uh, in an office. But it closed soon after I was there, and the woman that had hired me took me to another job where I I was the printer. I, I controlled all the printing prints that they they made and I I sent those to the fellows that were in the shop. I would take them to a guy that was doing a certain job and then I would keep track of them and i I'm the one that also brought them to put away which had to go in these huge great big uh, printing uh, boxes, uh, 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 bars that were in walls, and it was it was an interesting thing. But anyway, that's one thing. I I joined them uh, from Los Angeles. Uh, I went there and I worked for North uh, North or uh, Air or North Road or <laughs> Airport. Uh, and they were making planes at that time. And so, once again, I was just a secretary for in, in an office, but in, I enjoyed it. Uh, and then I signed up because I lived with, I was living with five girls, my sister and all, uh, cousin, and, and then three others. And I got tired of it. It was too much. My uncle would come in with all these guys and they would stay over and I got tired of it. <laughs> So anyway, I joined the, I went and joined the, oh, I, jo I went to join and they went to take blood from me and I'll never forget it. I was on a big stage and all of these guys were in the line that they had to have the same thing. Blood was going to be taken from them. The first one saw I had, I had bad veins and they kept going up and down and arms go and, Finally, they had to call a doctor to come in to come to do it and took time. Every, it was a whole mess. Three guys passed out on the line. It was the biggest thing you ever saw. And I was, I was, I was shocked. I was really terrible. I felt terrible for the whole thing. <laughs> I thought it was my fault, but it wasn't. <laughs> but I certainly felt it. Um, <laughs> it was a, one of the things in your life that you never forget. Even, even the service, you have those things. I was on, I, after joining the service, that was in 1945, and in 46 I actually came by train, uh, and we went to Chicago where we had a layover, and we got to, north, uh, to uh, New York at, at three o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. Anyway, it was a big, a big college, and it was taken over by the, by the federal government, and all of us girls were on there. At three in the morning, they tested us for our voices. We had been singing for hours and shouting things, and so consequently, I think out of 10 girls, I was the only one that was chosen to go. 
and we sang on the radio every Sunday, and we sang uh, at, when we first marched. We had to, we, it, you, you formed and marched. And when you did this, you had to start a song. And everyone could come up with songs to sing. We sang many a song. It, it, we had, we lived in apartments above where the um, college was. And uh, it was, they were huge. And we had about six of those big homes that were divided for us. And we lived, you know, two in a room and um, we learned to get those be beds in great order or you got, you got penalized. One time, <laughs> our first leave, somebody threw something in a, in a garbage can and lo and behold, what did happen to us? <laughs> we, our, our officer came and said, we had bad room and we were all gonna have to uh, suffer for it. We would have no outing that day. And so, am I going to get late? I still have a lot to talk about. <laughs> I, my, I must talk about how I got into the serv service. My c commanding officer a actually became my husband, so that's why I have <laughs> here. <laughs> that's a good way to end it. <laughs> Okay. Well, and that kind of answers, how was your military experience shaped? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just give one thing? Of course. In the in Petaluma paper, I don't, anybody that lived in Petaluma might have seen it, but there was a man, one of the men that was a serviceman, and uh, he had saved so many Jews, it's just our, our, our uh, that, that had those kind of fellows, and the, it's fantastic to read what happened to him. But he had at least, uh, well, he was telling about one that he took from there, and, the, and the, that one lived somewhere in Petaluma area, and he came to him and showed him that he had maybe three or four others that he had sh sh uh, saved and it didn't even know it. Yeah, I think it's a, a wonderful article. Of, and his name was Henry Studenmeyer. And he just died, he was 93, so he was a World War II and really deserved a lot of honor. Well, thank you, Mary Lou. I bet you'll have an opportunity to speak more later. Um, our next panelist is Emily Sousa, who um, was in the US Navy during the Korean War. So, Emily. Tell us about your hometown. Okay, I was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina. My dad worked for Southern Railway, and it was a railroad center. Uh, he wanted to join the service when the war started, but he was too old. He was 43 when I was born, so when the war started, I was seven, so that would have made him about 50. Uh, he was an air raid warden for our neighborhood. I don't know if you guys grew up where they had him or not, but he had to go out when the alarm went off, make sure all the lights were out and that no one was out on the street. Uh, the troop trains passed right in front of my house, so we would go out on the sidewalk and we'd wave at them. If the train stopped, we'd run up to the train and ask them where they were going. And it was really an interesting sight to see. When President Roosevelt died, they took his body from Georgia to Washington, and they had to go through my hometown to get him there. So the whole town was on the sidewalk watching the trains go by with this flag draped uh, on the on the train uh, and so I really felt that I experienced history when I saw the train go by we also had a German prisoner of war uh, camp Camp Croft in my own town and it was also a college town we had Wofford which was the man's college Converse which was the ladies community college and a business college 
I graduated in 52 in a class of 251 people. I started work at the phone company one week later and I stayed for 15 months. Now I'm going to go back a few years and tell you why I wanted to go into the service. My ancestors fought in the Revolutionary War, the Confederate Army, and the War of 1812, and I'm sure uncles, great uncles, fought in the First World War. I had brothers and cousins in the military as well. My boyfriend was on a battleship fighting in the Korean War. We planned to meet in San Diego. Is it any wonder I wanted to join the Navy? My mother liked the Navy uniform best of all, <laughs> so she wanted to see me in a Navy uniform. Uh, when, uh, okay, four of my classmates joined the, four of us from the same high school joined the Navy together. We all went to boot camp in Bainbridge, Maryland. Uh, we took the train to Bainbridge. While we were in boot camp, we had to dive into a swimming pool and swim the length of the pool at the bottom of the pool. The story was the ship had been bombed and was on fire. And I passed the test. We had to make our own life jackets by tying our sleeves and pants legs together. We'd slap them down, fill them with the air. Uh, so that they would keep us afloat. In boot camp, all of the trainers were female officers. We had our own mess hall. Sex with the sailor was illegal. You never heard about sexual harassment. Only two in our company did not receive extra duty as discipline. And guess what? I was one of the two. <laughs> For every demerit you had, you had to work an hour, work, like scrubbing floors and doing all sorts of things. Uh, we were allowed to request where we wanted to be stationed. I requested San Diego because I had promised my boyfriend that I would meet him there. My dad wanted me to take the train to San Diego because we were used to riding the train all of our lives. He didn't want me to fly, and he also wanted me, instead of going to the base at night, he wanted me to go to a hotel. Well, I disobeyed him because I had been on a base, and I felt safer going to the base than to the hotel. So I went to the base, and I met a sailor who was a gate guard, and his name was Alfred. But he was told by the chief to take my luggage to my barracks. They did that in those days. <laughs> so anyway, he had my name, and he always remembered my name, and my name was Wingo, like bingo, but with the W. So every time I would go in and out the gate, if he was on duty, he would say, hey, Wingo, where are you going? Hey, Wingo, let's go have coffee. And I told him no that I had a boyfriend fighting in the Korean War on a battleship, and I could not go out with him. Well, he insisted. He never quit. He drove me crazy. <laughs> so I finally said, okay, I'll go to the movies with you. So then I started dating him. <laughs> and then he wanted to get married, and he was talking about it, and I said, no. And then I told him one day, I have to talk to you, and, and I was going to break up with him. So I told him, I said, I can't date you anymore. My boyfriend's going to come home soon. This is over. Can't see you anymore. And then I looked at him, and I said, I'm lying. I really want to go out with you. So I sent my boyfriend on the it, well, wherever he was, a uh, dear John, yeah. So anyway, uh, we got married, and we were married 62 years, and he died in 19, uh, I mean 2016. Um, he served in the occupation of Japan three years, and he was aboard ship one year, 
So I only knew him, uh, he was in for six, so I only knew him two of those years. So when it came time for him to get out, I really felt very, very sad. Uh, we had our first child in San Diego at the Balboa Naval Hospital. Uh, the base is no longer there. We returned for our 25th wedding anniversary and we were allowed to go back on base. And then on our 50th, I contacted the Navy and they said we could go to any base in San Diego, but NTC is no longer there. It's uh, businesses and condos mm -hmm. and but the chapel is still there we went there for a 60th wedding anniversary <laughs> and the chapel was still there and the play our first place we lived was still there and then we lived in Navy housing and I really hated it when he got out I thought what are we gonna do in life our life has changed so much uh, but anyway, uh, I have, uh, we have five uh, grandchildren that are in the service, or that was in the service. We have one that's in the reserves. We have one that got out a year ago. He was stationed in South Korea, and he's in college. Uh, we have another one that will retire, the one in reserves will retire in a couple of years. Uh, we have one that's a nurse practitioner. Uh, and we also have one that's working at, uh, in Battle Creek, Michigan, at the Veterans Medical Center as a medical technologist. And then I have another grandson that served in the Army. Um, I'm sure the discipline and the training and discipline in the Navy has helped me in every job I ever had. I took advantage of benefits offered. Uh, I went to college under the GI Bill. I also worked for Exchange Bank and if we took banking classes and they paid for our college. Uh, I left Exchange and went to work for uh, Bank of Sonoma County, which is now West America and has been for many, many years. I uh, was the manager of the bank. I was the second manager in Sonoma County. It was really, banking was really a man's world as far as bosses. I retired as an assistant vice president um, I was promoted several times um, working for the bank, and I really have no regrets at all. We traveled to every continent except um, Africa and Antarctica, and we traveled to every state except Vermont. And uh, I feel that we had a very successful life. I was once voted boss of the year when I worked for uh, West America. And um, so, you know, I really feel that the military is the place to go if you want to get ahead. Thank you, Emily. My name is Kate O'Hare Palmer, and I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon. It's so wonderful to hear Mary Lou and Emily's story. I'm excited. Um, my mom was in World War II, and my dad, they were, that's how they met, too. It seems like that was kind of like a lot of people met when they were in the military, huh? Anyway. Um, is it blinking? Yeah. So I'm I'm representing the yeah. So we'll have to turn the lights down. Huh? Let's see. I'm representing a, a woman that served during the Vietnam era, and um, my story is I I was raised in Southern California, in Long Beach and Seal Beach, and both my parents I said were in the Army Army Air Corps. My mom was a radio operator, and my dad was a uh, link trainer for pilots. Uh, they were in Florida, and that's how they met. They were both sergeants. And um, so I had two brothers, 
and we kind of came from a military family. I think that happens a lot. Uh, it's even today, if you have somebody that's in the military, you're more likely to have, to have somebody go into the military. Some of the families that don't have anybody in the military, they're not even, they don't know about it, so they're not as likely to go in. That's, that's what they found out. So I went through um, Woodrow Wilson High School in Long Beach, and then I went on to Los Angeles County General Hospital. It was a three-year nursing program in those days, a diploma. You know what those are, diploma programs? They were three years instead of four years. And um, I did my training there, and my brother had been in Vietnam two years before me. So he sent me um, pictures, and we lived on, I lived on the seventh floor of the dorm. It was a big nursing program there during uh, that time, and uh, there were 200 in my class alone. That was a big, big group. But he sent us pictures when he was in Nam, and we had pen pals, uh, some of the girls on the floor. Four of us decided that we would go into the uh, military when we graduated, okay? And it wasn't because we had been on a scholarship. A lot of uh, women that were nurses in training, they went into a scholarship program, so they owed the military a, c a couple of years after they got out. But ours was just, we just wanted to go in. And we actually went to the Navy first. But we wanted to go in right when we graduated. And it wasn't about the uniform, it was just we wanted to go into the <laughs> Navy. But it turned out that they, uh, need, we needed two years nursing experience. And we would only have one if we went into basic training and went to a hospital before we went overseas or whatever. So we went right down the uh, next room down in LA where they were doing the recruiting and we joined the Army. So we went to Fort Sam Houston in Texas for basic training. We had a section where we uh, went to Camp Bullis to do our uh, go under the wires and learn how to shoot and all that kind of stuff. They, they put us through it because they figured we were going to be, most of us, it was a class of 300, most of us were going to end up in Vietnam. That's a picture of me at graduation. So, a long time ago. And at the bottom, I wrote that before we decided to go in the military because I said I was going to work at Harbor General Hospital and I wanted to work with children. But that, that certainly changed. I did work with a lot of kids over in Vietnam. And that was graduation uh, from basic training at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Um, I'm going to go on. I, I'm doing a little bit different here because I wanted to give you a little history of what it was like to be an Army nurse in Vietnam. Because there were only about 10,000 of us that served in country, women. There was about 250, uh, 265 women, 265,000 women that served during the Vietnam era all over the world. So it's a big group, you know, but there was a smaller group that served actually in country. There's two, uh, there's different women's organizations. I took, I took the biggest one, WIMSA, Women in Military Service of America, just to let you know about it, because it's in Arlington, back in Washington, D.C. It's a great place to go see, a lot of history there. And then I was part of the Vietnam Women's Memorial Foundation. It took 10 years to build that memorial. And that happened, that was dedicated in 1993. So that was for a lot of the women that had served in all branches and in all jobs, not just nurses, during the Vietnam era. And that's on the mall uh, near where the Vietnam Wall is. Um, after we went through basic training at Camp Bullis and Fort Sam Houston, I went on to San Francisco, was stationed at Letterman. And now there's a Walt Disney Museum there. <laughs> But then, it, it was kind of Mickey Mouse, huh? But um, we, it was a great place to be. It was a great duty station. Uh, there was a lot going on there. We had a lot of um, patients that were coming back from the war already, because that was in 1968. And uh, it was in January when I started my operating room nurses course there, after I'd worked on the surgical floors. But because the war was amping up so much, they shortened our OR course from eight months to four months. 
And so then we were sent, we got our leave time and we were, I went home to Seal Beach to say goodbye to everybody and that was during the time when Robert Kennedy was killed, assassinated, right before that. And then we, I went over with one of my roommates from San Francisco, uh, Mary Lou, and I were the only two women on that plane going over to Vietnam. We were in uniform, we had nylons, we had low heels. It was hysterical when you think about it now. And when we got to Vietnam, it was like you walked out the door and it was just 110 degrees. And we were in such kind of shock because we'd been up so long. And the biggest thing was the smell and also looking at the men that were waiting to get on the plane that we were exiting. That was something because I looked at those men and I went, oh my God. They were exhausted, they were filthy, but they were ready to get on that plane to come home. They couldn't wait until we all got off. And then they put us in a bus with the screens on the uh, top of it so we couldn't see where we were going. And then we got to, a, um, to the big base long bin there and we got our assignments on where we were gonna go. So I ended up in, uh, there's, I had that picture up there. The first hospital unit I went to was a, what's called an evacuation hospital. It was called Second Surgical, but they changed the name because a surgical hospital is like 60 to 100 beds, mainly general surgery and orthopedics. An evacuation hospital is like 300 to 400 beds, and that's what happened. This hospital grew so fast, and so, um, I started out there, and I, this is the picture of the emergency room of the evacuation hospital. The picture there, it has these orange barrels on it. And I show that because that's Agent Orange. And any of the veterans that are in the room, and I see a lot of them, we've all been affected by Agent Orange because they use that as a defoliant there. And there are 27 cancers related to Agent Orange that, are effect, that have affected most of us during our lifetime. That's what the evacuation hospital looked like. They had big red crosses on it, and I remember riding home to my mom saying, wow, these are great targets, you know? I mean, it was like, it was amazing, but it was right on the ocean, and because I'd grown up, grown up in Seal Beach, I said I wanted to go to the ocean. I didn't get there very much. This is what it looked like in the emergency room. The litters were brought in, the patients were brought in from the helicopters, put on the litters and brought into the emergency room. And they were triaged there. Uh, and then they were taken either to surgery or if it was a medical uh, reason that they were in the hospital. And there were a lot of medical reasons. 69% of the uh, admissions to hospitals in Vietnam were actually medical reasons. Fever of unknown origin, worms, snake bites, lots of different things. They, they stepped on things and got infected feet. It was a lot of different things. This is an amputation and that was the other step on a lot was a bouncing Betty, uh, so they would lose a limb. That's the chapel. And then, I, so I served there for six months and um, Mary Lou, you taught, or Actually, Emily, you said you didn't see any harassment in, the, in, in your service time. You didn't have any. We, didn't, we started having harassment of women, I think, more when, uh, at least in my service time. So that, that's something that I, know, I experienced, and a lot of the other women did too. There, the numbers were so small. We were so few women compared to all the men. I think that may be a switch back to my second surge unit because that was the people that I started with. And you, you really have big bonds with people that you work with. And when the 312th of Act came in, it was a group from North Carolina, and I wanted to go back to the people that I was working with. And we had moved. Second Surge Hospital had moved down to um, another area and we were supporting an infantry, another infantry unit. So we ended up in this rubber plantation here and this was the hospital, very small. And we had to pay $75 for every tree that we cut down to make that hospital. And we lived in tents with no water. Our shower was a Coke can with holes in it. 
We wore tennis shoes because we didn't want to get those green vipers coming up through to bite us because that was a poisonous snake then. But you know, as bad as it was, and we actually we ate, we ate sea rations that said 1943 on it until they got until they got the the um, the kitchen together. But this is what the hospital looked like. It was an inflatable with uh, jet fuel, and this is what it looked like inside the hospital. Where the pay, everything was put together so that hopefully this wouldn't happen. We would get rocketed at night, and you can see the revetments were here. They were like six feet high because of the frags that we would have coming in with the rocket attacks. During that time, we would keep operating too, where we were there, because we had the revetments so high, we could just keep on, keep on going. This is kind of, I had talked about that before. We had a lot of diseases that were, um, besides the, the uh, injuries. And I think, for me, one of the things that was the hardest was um, having to put the expectants off to the side. The people that weren't going to live, that we maybe wouldn't have a chance to help. We had to put them off to the side. This is what it looks like bringing in the wounded. And this is what I would say, teamwork. Teamwork of being in the military and just like Mary Lou said, I think it was the hardest part of my life, and I had some good therapy after I got back, but the teamwork and respect for each other that we gained has been with me my whole life, and I served in nursing for over 30 years, so it was a good place to, uh, it was bad, but it was good. So anybody that's been through a war will say that. And your life is before you went into the military, when you're in a uh, war zone, and then after you come home. And it is what you make of it. I'll leave it at that. I have a question. Yeah. I've been to Vietnam. Uh -huh. We took one of the first cruises to go in there, and they were selling dog packs. Oh, my gosh. When I came home from that trip, I said I would never go back to Vietnam because I knew those dog packs belonged to the VVA, Vietnam Vets of America, is the only group that um, goes back every year to uh, exchange information with the Vietnamese on a higher level to get remains to bring back. We're the only group that does that on a yearly basis. And those kinds of things usually are given back. So that's, when was that? But this was, it was not too long after the war ended, and we were on one of the I had five children, and my oldest boy uh, served four presidents as a, as a um, secret serviceman, and uh, all the I, I just had to put it in because <laughs> I forgot it. <laughs> Lisa Lim, U.S. Army, Persian Gulf, is our next panelist. I am born in Malaysia in a small town called Batu Pahat, south of the peninsula. <clears throat> so with the map of Vietnam, it's actually two countries south of Vietnam. And I was born in the late 70s, so it was soon after, actually during uh, the late Vietnam War. And um, there was a form of affirmative action in Malaysia that uh, restricted some of my opportunities. And therefore, when I had the chance to come to the US, um, it was 2009, closer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was about 2009 when it was the, the banking crisis. And I had decided to want to stay in the US and I was on a work permit. And it was during the Fort Hood shooting that I learned about an opportunity where uh, the military allowed non-immigrant 
immigrants to enlist with the military. And, um, and thanks to Google, <laughs> so I did a lot of research and learned that uh, I had about a month to get myself enlisted and apply for the program. So it was through that program that um, I enlisted with the U.S. Army. And um, I at first enlisted as a food specialist because as a non-immigrant, um, I don't have security clearance, which makes a lot of sense. And I had a choice of either a food specialist or um, 88 Mike, which was a truck driver. <laughs> so um, I understood as a food um, specialist, and it was during my delayed entry program that I learned about the band. So there is military, there are military bands in the U.S. Army. Um, there is the ones that you see on TV, on media. That's usually the special, uh, the special bands that plays for the president. <coughs> But there are also the regular army bands that play for everything that is music related in all the bases, um, which includes change of command, um, 4th of July, bugle services, uh, memorials, uh, community services. So I auditioned for the band, and one day before I was to ship out as a food specialist, I received a phone call from a recruiter telling me that I was selected by the audition team as a musician. And so that was a change of my job description with the military. And because I was in the band, I was given um, choices for my assignment, and one of them was the 82nd. And I um, had discussed with a colleague of mine at a point who served in the Vietnam War, and he was in the 82nd. And after hearing his story, I said, well, if this is going to be a one-time opportunity for me, and if I'm going to serve as a musician whose mission really is to build morale for the troops downrange, I think 82nd is the best option for me to uh, increase my opportunity, actually to increase my chances of deployment. Mm -hmm. However, during basic training, um, we go through similar basic training as there's only one basic training for everybody. Okay. Um, and by my time, actually, I'm not sure if um, the previous years, uh, was it mixed gender? Because in my time, it was mixed gender. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, yes, it's okay. Yeah. okay. So we were, um, I was shipped to Fort Seal. And this was during a time where Fort Seal was traditionally a all male only um, basic training location, and when I was there, uh, we were the second batch of um, recruits to be integrated um, to have an integrated training. Um, and I was the third oldest recruit <laughs> at 31. Um, and it was in uh, my second week of training that I hurt my back, um, herniated my disc. And during that time, um, it was a tough call because I was in this gray area in terms of my, my status, my immigrant status. Because in order to enlist, I had to give up my um, work permit. And before I gra uh, and in order to get my citizenship, I need to graduate from basic training. So we, we had what we call the 800 milligram Motrin, the horse pills we call them. Uh, so it was through many of those um, in the next couple of weeks to graduate from basic training. And surprisingly, I graduated as an honor grad. Um, I, I, I think it's because um, I I, I had a lot more <laughs> at stake, I guess, um, or, or I would get deported. Um, and the other, the other issue that I had when I arrived at my uh, duty station at 82nd was that I uh, did not recover from my back injury, which is why on my uniform you don't see um, my airborne patch, because I was not airborne qualified. Now, being in the division as a non-airborne 
um, paratrooper. It's a different <laughs> ball game altogether. <laughs> and then on top of that, as a musician, we get a lot of trouble. Excuse me. Right. Um, so now having said that, as, um, as an older um, specialist, who we call glorified privates, um, I was also given a um, number of responsibilities um, to help out in the unit because in the military band, we not only do our job description as musicians, we also um, manage our own supply, our um, HR, our own shops. Um, and when my unit was deployed, I had to stay in the rear detachment and provided support from them from stateside. So yes, military bands do get deployed. And when my unit was deployed, they went into um, forward operating bases, small little bases, especially the small ones, uh, via helicopters, um, Black Hawks and Chinooks. Um, and no, we don't repel from <laughs> with our music instruments. Um, but what I've heard and I've received news from my unit is that those were the best times because the troops downrange were so deprived of home mm -hmm. that whenever they hear music from home, um, we were play they were playing rock, rock music most of the time. They, they really ap appreciated um, the band being there. Now, um, the 82nd band during Iraq was also um, doubled up as security guards. So we, <laughs> because we were first trained as soldiers first, mm -hmm. So um, the 82nd was actually guarding um, General Petraeus uh, during Iraq. So uh, that is why the, mi the military band in the 82nd is um, a special breed in the sense that we need to uh, stay sharp all the time and at the same time be able to endure any, any form of, um, <laughs> any form of uh, description that is thrown on us. Um, so that is kind of um, my experience with the service. Now, I've also heard, I personally did not experience um, any uh, military, uh, any um, sexual assault. However, uh, I unfortunately have um, friends who were affected by um, those traumas and because of the low number of women in the military, uh, there is a form of, um, we, we don't talk about it, which is why um, after um, the service, um, I use my GI Bill now to go back to school, and part of my research is to learn more about the prevalence of PTSD among women veterans. And unfortunately, I'm learning that there is an increasing number of women veterans who are becoming homeless. Um, and it's also due to the lack of resources that they, or rather due to the lack of awareness that there are resources that would help them. And part of the reason is because the trauma that they experienced were in the service. So when VA provides services, usually it, it, the, the environment reminds them of the service, and so they would try to get help somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So um, I know Santa Rosa Library has connected with um, Vet Connect to provide resources for veterans. So like what Rose said earlier, if you know of any women veterans um, who are struggling for resources, uh, feel free to connect anyone with one of us. Lisa's mentioning a Vet Connect. We have Kate Keaton in the back um, from the Central Santa Rosa Library. So we'll um, be connecting, connecting, no pun intended, um, with her a little bit later. So, um, so question though for you, Lisa, what instrument do you play or perhaps you sing? Oh. <laughs> um, while I was in the service, I played the keyboards. <laughs> and um, when we are marching, I play the cymbals. And okay. sometimes in some change of command, I'll be playing the bass drum. Mm -hmm. So it really depends. Um, and in concert band, I'll be, I'll, I'll be a percussionist. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what the event is. So we double up as 
quite a number of things. Yes, you do. Yes. Interesting. Thank you. So um, our next panelist is Bethany LaRosa from the U.S. Coast Guard Active Duty. Take it away. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to top that, so we'll see. <laughs> First off, I'm completely thankful and truly blessed to be here with all these women who paved the way for someone like me. So I want to thank them. Hometown is uh, Charleston, South Carolina. is where I was born. My dad is retired Navy, so I lived in Texas. Um, military family, so definitely agree with you. Um, only 1% of Americans serve. So. Um, why I decided to enter the military um, to serve a bigger purpose than myself and educational benefits. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard to hear these stories and realize that it's 2019 and women are still struggling with being treated equal. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It's hard to talk about. Thank you, I would have to say I love being in the Coast Guard. I've never had a challenge of doing anything I didn't want to do because I was a female. I would have to say I think I was born out to sea. One of my favorite pens is my Cutterman pen because you have to have at least five consecutive years of seat time. And I feel like I truly am blessed to be a part of one of the few Cutterman. Um, my military experience, I feel like um, just being something bigger than who you are yourself. And I reflect back on it and I just think of the structure, the discipline, the people, and the females who paved the way before me. And this month will be 12 years that I've been serving active duty. So the reason I joined the Coast Guard, so to lighten the mood. <laughs> so I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and um, I had an appointment with an Air Force recruiter. And <laughs> it was set for 10.30 and my parents always said show up early. Well, Air Force had a sign that said out to lunch. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's 10.30. <laughs> I'm in the best uniform, or best outfit I could possibly be in, and I pass by, um, and I see this sign that says Coast Guard Recruiting. <laughs> and um, I go in, I see this 30 seconds of Coast Guard on the water, doing all these amazing things, and I was like, Coast Guard? There, there's a such thing? I'm in, in San Antonio where every hub of the Air Force is, and everywhere you look, there's Air Force. Um, so, joining the Coast Guard and telling my family, yeah, I signed up for the military today, and they're like, okay, so when you start boot camp, it's right down the street, I'll take you. I was like, no, I'm going to K-May, New Jersey for the Coast Guard. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was one of the things. Um, personal accomplishments, I always am in a room with all males. All of my role models have always been males. Mm -hmm. So trying to do whatever I can to continue to challenge myself to stay in and serve so a woman can have a role model and it be a female. So that's definitely one of the things that I attribute to try to be a part of. But that's it. <laughs> now that I cried. <laughs> <laughs> so my first unit out of Cape May, New Jersey, was um, the Polar Sea. It's uh, there's only two non non nuclear polar icebreakers, and um, my first two years on the boat, um, we went out to the Arctic. We actually had NOAA who funded us, so we did a polar bear expedition and sea lion expedition. So who would have thought they're sending a ship underway to look at sea lions or polar bears? <laughs> so I was lucky to be a part of that. I would have duties where I'd be on front of the ship. We're shoveling ice over just to land on top of ice that we're breaking. So <laughs> it was one of those things. I would pass around hot cocoa because there was ice everywhere and people were cold. Um, I then went from being on the icebreaker, I decided to do an operations specialist. 
Um, it actually was radio men, TCs back in the day, and they kind of merged it into quartermaster. So I decided to be an operations specialist, completed school. I went to uh, Air Station, Sector Corpus Christi, Texas, because I kind of missed home, but not too much, because it's like two hours away. So just enough to be able to see family. From there, I got to earn this pin, which is one of my favorite pins. It's a search and rescue. So it's a national certification. I got to go, and which I thought, oh my god, this is incredible. I'm an actual search and rescue, right? Like, where's my cape? I'm Wonder Woman. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it comes with so much more responsibility than I was mentally prepared for. Um, I did five years on there, and then I actually got orders to the National Security Cutter, which is the Weishi out of Alameda, so not that far away. I served three years on that ship. I met my husband in the military. <laughs> and um, from there, I decided that, I was realizing that our rate is missing people. We can't retain women, and we can't retain my rate. So my way to give back to my service was I'm gonna be an instructor at Two Rock. And so I decided if I can't figure out what's wrong with our future, like nobody can in my mind. So, <laughs> so um, I've been there for a little over two years and that's how I met Rose during the Women Equality. I had her be a guest speaker, so. And now I'm blessed to be a panelist today, so thank you. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions from the audience? I'm from Orange County. A lot of my friends were um, Long Beach, Seal Beach. And you said you work for Grumman uh, Aircraft Corporation. I knew Bert Kinner and his children. Do you remember of a, a, a Kinner Aircraft Corporation? No? No. Okay. Bert Kinner built Amelia Earhart's uh, Canary airplane. He oh. built. Lucky Ken Electra. Yes. Mr. Kinner built, um, I think, three of her planes, mm -hmm. one of them being the Canary, which was a very famous plane. Uh. But um, I used to hang around with his daughter and a couple of the kids from Kinner oh. Corporation who eventually sold out to McDonnell Douglas. So that was my hometown, more or less. Oh, yeah. So this question is, what did you learn in the military that added, that aided you in civilian life? And it sounds like a general question for all of you. Some of you have touched on it, I think. But would you like to add to it? Discipline was a big part of it. Um, and, you know, the, the whole thing was, was a great experience. And it was the only place you're going to experience the things that we experience is in the military. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, I walked away and I, I didn't want to walk away. But I couldn't stay in because you couldn't have children and stay in the military. But I would have stayed in if I could have. I would have stayed in retired. Yeah, yeah. But now everything's changed. But you, um, you talked about your experience um, as a work a career in banking, and right. you were very successful at that. So. I think you're saying. But, but the military, I'm sure, added to that. Because when you work in a bank, you have to follow the rules. And when you're in the military, <laughs> you have to follow the rules. So, you know, so, so I think it had a great deal to do with my future after I left the military. Anybody else want to add to that? I just want to say a dumb thing because I grew up. <laughs> Sorry, no dumb things. <laughs> I grew up in the in the service because I had to take the girls. The first uh, job that I had when I got to the to the base was I had to uh, take girls after two o'clock that came in. They had to come in and sign in. 
And then they would tell their stories, and I grew up with that. With all these things I never heard about, the, it was a whole new life. But other than that, it was, it was fine. But it was, two, after two o'clock, I always listened to all of them. One of them got suspended because she was using the service for making money. And, she, and the dumb thing that she did, she was sending it home from the bank that was on the base of all the dumb ones. But anyway. <laughs> I think for me, um, the fact that I, that I survived a war, you know, and uh, we went into the military as nurses. So we honestly didn't see ourselves as, I was a lieutenant, and uh, I didn't see myself as that for a long time. But the fact is, is that you had to do a lot of things. I learned how to do more things when I was in the military and stretch my nursing capabilities way beyond what I would have done in private sector. And that was something when I got home and worked in a private hospital, I, I knew a lot and we couldn't practice in the same level. But what it did do for me, um, the good side and the bad side, was I knew that I could do anything if I put my mind to it. I really did. I went through a period of, um, after, after I had my kids, and that was way later, I went through um, my PTSD experiences because I started having flashbacks. So it took me back a little ways because I felt so vulnerable. So I was strong for so many years, but there was a part of me that was so vulnerable that never had a chance to get out. So in a way, the experience of being in the military, it let me grow at another level afterwards to be who I am today. It takes a lot of steps to get, and I'm 72. So it's like we grow up or we stay frozen in amber. You have those two choices, right? And I think you're seeing women here that really have grown up. For me as an immigrant, I think it is such an honor to hear the stories from, to, to be a member of this panel. And um, the resiliency that I have learned through the military has actually helped me integrate with Americans in general, the better, um, because afterwards I learned that depending on what states you're from, you have a different si different form of social norms. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> did not experience that uh, when I was in the military because it was a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. um, so through it, also in basic training, I mean, our identities were all stripped off until we are just being called by numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that kind of training, it has helped me um, in my civilian life to appreciate people as who they are and to also be transparent um, and to use my words better. Mm -hmm. um, there is something what we call embracing the suck. Uh, <laughs> where that's one thing that um, might be a little harder in the civilian life because um, there are times where you hear um, certain complaints at work and you go, that's kind of trivial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, I, I, and I think because of that, it also um, makes veterans, the camaraderie that we have with veterans um, that much stronger. I had two dads that raised me in the military, and my partner here is a Vietnam veteran. Um, so my stepdad went through Vietnam. Um, I was raised very, very strictly and never even considered the option of going into the military because I graduated high school and got out of the house as fast as I could and got married. But I was very touched by what all of you women um, said you paved the path for us and um, I with that discipline in the military family that I grew up in I, I was very successful as a businesswoman moved back to Sonoma County when I was 22 years old with a newborn baby and was one of the top paid women professional in this county and I think a lot of that came from the discipline um, 
I just really gained a whole new appreciation for my military family based on what you shared and what I took into my adult life. And I thank you all the way down. You're just amazing. You know, I just wanted to comment. You mentioned about a couple of things. It's about harassment. And in my time back then, in the early 70s, it was bad. Really bad. And it's when it all started. And I, re I remember specifically because I remember when DOD integrated us. I was there. I was at the band at the time. I mean, I didn't stay with the band. I went on to other things. But we got integrated. We were ordered. i never forget the day the uh, representative from DOD, Department of Defense, came to my unit, and I was the commander, and said, we're going to send you the first man, and we want you to integrate him into the band. Well, I had 80 women in the band that had been there for years, and they did not want this integration. You know, I didn't want the integration because we were very specific. But we were ordered to do the integration. He didn't want to be there either. Okay. So as the commander, I had a balancing act here. It was very hard because he didn't want to be there, we didn't want him, and I was caught in the middle. Um, and it was a rough time, very rough time. And that was just one small unit. But harassment was terrible. Um, in my position on and through the 70s and 80s, um, as an officer, I was the only officer at many military installations. The only woman officer in my, I was a trailblazer for a lot of things, and I won't go into all of it. But I was told, you're going to do this, and you're going to be in charge of all the women at the installation, because I don't want to deal with tampons. A colonel in Alaska told me that specifically when I reported in. You're going to take care of all the women here. Okay, and I was a young captain. Um, when I went to jump school, okay, and I, I have airborne wings, so I got hurt too. I have a very bad back to this day because I got injured on my third jump, but I did go back and finish it. Um, one time I got to jump week, there was only one enlisted woman and me left out of six women, and there were 230 men. They put me in one C-130, her in the other C-130, and I, I still hate it to this day. They held on to us on our butts right here, had to have their hands on our private parts to hold us while the green, until the green light went off. And you know I'm talking about Lisa. All right. And then they said, they used to yell and say, well, if they go, you have to go. So the men were intimidated. And then they would slap us on the butt out the plank. And the harassment at jump school was awful. So when I got injured on my third jump on the field and I landed wrong, um, luckily there was a nice Marine and he came over and he said, you're really hurt, aren't you? And I said, yes. What I had to do that day, um, because I was plain load commander, I had to get everybody off the field. I didn't want to disguise the fact that I had a possible broken foot, broken tailbone, etc., almost a broken right foot. I had to disguise that. And so for the rest of the day, I had to make sure everybody got off the field. I had to march them over to the shed where we did the rigging for the afternoon. It wasn't until like 6 o'clock that night we got back. And I had to cover this up because if I didn't cover it up, then they would wash me out. And they'd say, see, it's another woman. She can't do it. So I was in terrible pain that whole day. And at 6 o'clock that night, luckily we had a chiropractor. And he came and he said, you were running on a broken foot all afternoon. And... Um, uh, I have some real stories, I tell you. Um, it was awful. And I don't know why it lasted 22 years, but I did. Because I wanted to make the way for people behind me. And I know that the day I voluntarily retired, I, had, I just had had it. And said, someone has to pick it up from here. Because my colleagues, my, I know I had some colleagues in my WAC officer class that were so harassed and everything, they got kicked out because they wouldn't sleep with the guy. They wouldn't go to date this guy. I mean, so many of them were ruined. And we had the first woman helicopter pilot. We had the first woman EOC specialist in my class. Um, so many things. But the harassment is bad today, yes. And you all are still dealing with it. And I'm sorry. We tried the best we could. But it's not going to change until the old guard's gone. It's not going to change, excuse me, until number 45 types are gone, if you know what I mean. And um, 
I, I just hope you all don't mind me saying this. I've got 50% PTSD. I have 100% VA disability, okay? I'm ruined for the rest of my life as far as severe pain. But it's, it's just was awful, and it's still awful today, and I'm so sorry you all have to deal with it. But I, what I wanted to say was as an officer, the women would come to me when I was a lieutenant colonel. The women, the enlisted women would come to me and say, help me. This man just showed up. I remember one night ROTC. This, this colonel showed up in my barracks last night, stood over me, and I was in my undies, and tried to rape me. Now, what am I supposed to do? He come, they come to me, and I'm the only woman officer. Another woman came to me, an ROTC cadet. I was a, with ROTC region at the time. Other stories like that. And I had this burden, and I didn't know what to do, and I had to go to the general and tell him and stuff. I paid the price because I had to report it. Because in those days, I talked with my friend Gloria, we didn't have anybody to go to. There was no one to go to. At least now you at least have a little bit of a help of a chain. In those days, we didn't know who to go to. And when I did go to somebody as the only woman officer to help them, I got in trouble. I got chewed out and my career was ruined practically. So, you know, luckily you've got people ahead of you today that still help you. But you don't have the Dakowitz today, if you remember Dakowitz. Um, and the women's um, panels that helped you. So I'll shut up now, but um, there's just so much in the background that uh, people don't know that, um, and I'm sure the waves know a lot, uh, that, you know, it is what it is and it was what it was. Thank you. Uh, Paul, Paul and Molnar. My dad was in the Air Force 33 years and I was, went in the Army for the black band. Commander, thank you for your service, and thank you for paving the way for us. Yes, you're welcome, and thank you all for continuing to pave the way. Appreciate it. Yeah, when I went in, there was 900 active duty line officers, women officers, 900. Isn't that something? Service that I'm going to offer is for um, veterans getting out of the service after 2001. Um, so I do apologize. That the, if we can get more funding, we are going to hopefully extend the, um, and I'm, I speak on behalf of the, the group, but hopefully we can eventually extend to vets of the Vietnam War, veterans that got out before 2001. But there is a group, it's called Veterans Path. I'm wearing the sweatshirt for the camera. Um, they are, I don't know if you know them, they're in the Bay Area. Um, they teach, um, they, they really work with um, veterans that are trying to um, contend with uh, PTSD, MST, um, and just transitioning out of the military. I think we value, we saw what happened to the folks coming out of Vietnam, both the men and the women, um, and, and all, the th all the resources that you didn't have. And so this group was formed to try to help transition the Iraq War veterans um, better than, has, than those resources have been before anyway. That's a nonprofit. They have a women's program. It's called the Anchor Program, and it's amazing. I've gone through it, and I'm a veteran of um, the U.S. Army, and I know what you girls are talking about. Sorry, I shouldn't call you girls women, <laughs> of me of all people. But um, uh, it's a great program, and um, they're here in the Bay Area. They have uh, weekend retreats, and it's a community. And so I just want to put it out there because I'd love to be able to make sure it's on the Veteran Connect also. Uh, I just want to let you know that on November 6th, the Wednesday, the U.S. Air Force Band of the West will be in the vet building. And then I wanted to point out um, Connie Williams in the back in the red is our Petaluma History Room librarian. And she and Diana Spaulding have brought a whole collection of books that can be checked out. And they have some back there on the subject. And um, thank you all for coming.